The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast. This is episode 187. And we have a fantastic return guest for you today in Brian W. Peterson. (laughs) Brian was with us back on episode 65 all the way back in 2019, second year of the show. And uh, yeah, he's back today discussing his latest book, Paper Doll. And it is a fantastic and riveting book, uh, true tale, creative nonfiction kind of story uh one that you are going to find fascinating and uh you know we're gonna we're gonna be talking all about it everything that went into it the uh the writing discipline that he had to do i mean this took essentially this is like 20 years of writing that went into this book and there's so much good stuff about it and uh, there's so many interesting stories about uh, what went into writing it. So you're going to be hearing all about that along with some of the uh, other inspirations that he's gotten along the way and <laughs> as well as an unintentional call for collecting your personal family history because some of that's going away. I, you know, Brian and I both agree in this, in this uh, interview that uh, some of that seems to be going away, even though we have things like Ancestry.com and others like that. The little, the stories are going away, you know, and it's so fascinating to collect those letters from loved ones from years gone by. So, you know, on top of listening to this great interview today and uh, hearing all about Brian's book and then checking out the book, I also want to invite you to take a moment and handwrite a letter to a loved one. Surprise them, because imagine if it was you getting a handwritten letter from someone else. You know, it's just my little my little tidbit of the day. Take a moment and handwrite a letter to someone as a nice little surprise. I think you're going to be pretty happy with the results. Anyway, uh, on top of everything else that Brian and I are talking about, we also are discussing uh, that he is going back to Planet Comic Con in Kansas City. That is coming up this month, August 20th through the 22nd. Brian will have a table there, he'll have a booth, he'll have books on hand to sell you, to sign, so you can go and get your picture with him. I am going as well. Um, I will not have a booth as much as I wanted to this year, it just wasn't something I could make happen, Uh, but I will be in attendance. Um, Well, (laughs) I will be around, let me put it that way. I'm going to be wearing my Sample Chapter Podcast shirt. Uh, I've got a mask because I hear Kansas City's going back to the mask ordinance. So, you know, you're going to see a guy walking around wearing Sample Chapter stuff. Uh, You may see a few people actually wearing Sample Chapter stuff because my family's come along with me. But if you are there on Friday the 20th, make sure you head to the main stage at 4 o'clock where you can see me up on stage interviewing creature actor Spencer Wilding. That is going to be a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that everybody knows him from is that he is the new Darth Vader. So, yes, Rogue One, that epic scene in the hallway where Darth Vader gets to kick some butt, that was Spencer. And I get to have like 45 minutes on the stage with him talking about his career and uh, everything else that he's done because he's got some incredible movies under his belt. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you wanna if you wanna join in, make sure you're there for the four o'clock show. That's what I'm gonna be doing there. And if I have anything else pop up between now and then, I will make sure to let you know right here on the Sample Chapter Podcast. Uh, a little bit of house cleaning I need to do. Uh, no advertisements this week for sponsors. Got some hiccups in the way. And uh, before I get into that, let me say thank you so much and a, and a great big hello to Leslie. Uh, no last names because I don't I didn't get her permission before I recorded this, but I wanted to say thank you to Leslie. Uh, as it happens, just before I got, heard from Leslie, I got I found out through uh, Scribner, my favorite writing software, that you know, our partnership 
uh, actually accidentally or whatever, unintentionally came to an end. Our six month uh, partnership that we had done came to an end. Now that's not the end of it. Let me, let me be clear. That is not the end of our partnership. They are in the midst of some restructuring and some other things. Uh, we're going to be reconvening in the upcoming months, but for this month for sure, August and September, I will not have a sponsor with Scribner. That being said, I do still recommend you go and check them out, even if even if I'm not getting credit for it. I still think it's 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 such an incredible platform that I really think you ought to go and try it out. Uh, Leslie, bless her heart, she still went ahead and got Scrivener based on my love for it because I really do love it. I I absolutely adore it, and you know this week I've been having a blast writing Bandit Chronicles, doing the editing on there. And uh, side note, <laughs> I got finally got some good work going with the uh, the cover, and I'm so excited for that. So and I'm going to make sure to share that as well. So if you, I probably won't share it on the Sample Chapter podcast social media pages, but if you look me up on uh, Twitter or Facebook as author Jason A. Meiske, then you'll you can see those. I'll share that as soon as I have it ready. Anyway, uh, yeah. So that's that's Scrivener. Um, no official sponsorship with them right now, but uh, it's still in the works in the coming months. Also, Audible, uh, we are still partners. Let me be clear about that. We are still partners. However, they are also <laughs> in the midst of updating some behind-the-scenes stuff. And so all of their links that uh, they had given me previously, anybody actually, anyone out there who's dealing with Audible doing a partnership like this, uh, the links don't work. Now, you can still go in and sign up for a, uh, a free trial. Um, you can try and put in, you know, that it's from Sample Chapter, uh, Sample Chapter Podcast, or whoever it is you're trying to sign up from. I don't want to take away from somebody else that, that maybe you you're prefer to, but, um, but they'll, they're going to make things right later because uh, they know that right now those links are not working. And as soon as they have those working, they're going to send me new information that I've got to go through the process of signing back up again and get to get the links working. And as soon as those are, I will have that ad running again here on the show and uh, I will update that on the website. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, normally I'm quick about getting us over to the advertisements so that way you know what's going on. Um, but instead, I just talked about everything <laughs> this time. So I don't think I actually saved any time, did I? <laughs> Anyway, but uh, yeah, I, rest assured, uh, we've got some great stuff in the works. Um, I'm actually looking into Patreon right now because I've had a lot of people approach me about wanting to support the show, and and I think that's uh, my gosh, that what an incredible feeling that is to have people wanting to know how they can support me. Um, obviously, the best thing you can do is share your favorite episodes and uh, let other people know about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if you're interested in uh, supporting the show in a monetary way, stay tuned. And I uh, may have something set up with uh, with Patreon here real, real soon. Meanwhile, you can also go and check out my podcast friends, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network. They got about half a dozen shows over there. Two Does Review, Alamo Draft House, and of course the flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture Podcast. All of those are going to be there. Um, actually, the gang at Pop Goes the Culture, they're going to be at Planet Comic Con as well. So you'll be looking around for them. They're hosting, um, I know Joey, the head honcho over at Pop, he's going to be doing a lot of interviews himself. He's going to be on stage before I am uh, at the 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock show. So make sure you're there for that. Um, anyway, but you can click the link in the show notes to head over to that network and find all of the great shows at Pop Goes the Culture Network. I also want to thank my other podcast network, Project Entertainment Network, home to about 30 different shows of a very wide variety. Just about anything you are looking for, they have it available there. Uh, you know, Whether you're looking for writing, book, what books to read, uh, monster movies, opinionated shows, uh, shows about nothing, just whatever comedy stuff comes up that week, whatever they want to talk about, faith-based uh, the LGBT community, and the list goes on and on. Tons of great stuff over at Project Entertainment Network, including yours truly, the Sample Chapter Podcast. So click that link in the show notes for more like this one right here.
Hey everybody, it's Kevin Goatee. It's Kevin Israel. And you're listening to Gutting the Sacred Cow on the Project Entertainment Network. Hey Kevin, what exactly is Gutting the Sacred Cow? Gutting the Sacred Cow is a podcast where we invite comedians and talented people every episode to come on and trash a movie that you probably love or someone you know loves. That's right. We've trashed, but we, our guests, have trashed such films as Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Gone with the Wind, Grease, even Star Wars. Can you imagine the balls on that guy? Did he succeed? I cannot. Yeah. Well, listen, and you'll find out. But this is Kevin Goatee and Kevin Israel for Gutting the Sacred Cow. Okay, there he goes. That's another fantastic show, one that I really enjoy over at Project Entertainment Network. Follow the link in the show notes for their main page and uh, check out all the wonderful shows there. As always, if you want to, as I alluded to before, uh, if you want to follow along with the show, you can do so on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's just the Sample Chapter Podcast, and uh, just look us up that way. Very, very easy to find. We do. I share lots of stuff on there throughout the week, uh, the current episodes. I do some throwback Thursdays to old episodes, and, of course, uh, the links for our sponsors <laughs> when they're active. <laughs> uh, the, those kinds of things are on there. Uh, so make sure you're following us there. Uh, if you are not a social media type person, but you'd like to reach out, you can do so via email at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, let me know what you like, what you don't like. If you have a recommendation, a guest author for the show, then uh, you can tell me that. And of course, if you'd like to call, you can leave me a voicemail by calling one 660 851 1146. And definitely make it a fun voicemail so that I can play that in an upcoming episode. All right. Well, hey, uh, one more time. Thank you again to Leslie for reaching out to me and uh, best of luck with her writing. Uh, Leslie, again, you got to let me know when that book is ready because then we're going to be talking right here on the show. I'm going to get you on here when that book is ready. So I challenge you right now. Get that book done. Find me on social media so that I'll, I can follow you and know how that's coming along. And then uh, we're going to get you on the show whenever that hap- whenever that book is ready. Meanwhile, Leslie and everybody else listening, <laughs> let's get on over to our interview with a wonderful friend of the show, Brian W. Peterson, with his latest book, Paper Doll. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Welcome back. This is this is a really delightful guest I have with us today. Uh, one that I am excited to talk to again and catch up a little bit with. Uh, you know, and something in the air, something about 2021. I, I'm doing a lot of uh, going back and talking to previous guests, which is what today's guest is. And and this is uh, it's been nice. It's been very pleasant. And as I'm alluding to, today's guest is no exception to that. I am talking with Brian W. Peterson, who was last with us, oh my gosh, a long time ago, uh, episode 65, back in April of 2019, shortly after we had met at uh, Planet Comic Con, the last one that there was, for that matter. <laughs> uh, there hasn't been a Planet Comic Con since then. But uh, there's one coming up, and uh, Brian and I got to reconnect, and I'm so thrilled to have him back on the show today. Welcome back, Brian. Thank you very much. Although I was afraid I had the wrong number when you described me as delightful. <laughs> yeah. So I heard somebody on the, uh, actually on another podcast, describe me as uh, the sweetest guy they've ever met. And I'm like, are you talking about me? What? <laughs> yeah. That would ruin my reputation. I know that. <laughs> of course, as I sit here with, I'm trying to cut back on the cigars a little bit, promise my wife. So I'm sitting here with my little candle and my coffee and like, yes, life is good, but I'm not that sweet. Come on. <laughs> well, I'm kind of glad to hear it. <laughs> well, hey, man, how how have you been? It's uh, been a little while, and uh, how are you doing? You staying safe? Yeah, I've been doing well. And um, uh, my wife and I, we got the virus pretty bad and, um, you know, recovered. I recovered. She's still dealing with it, but um, we're getting there been a weird time but i've one thing i made sure i was going to do Mm -hmm. was i was going to take 
advantage of the fact that I've been, you know, going hardly anywhere and spending more time writing. And it, that really worked out. So there were a couple of odd bright sides to being locked down. And one of them is for writers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I had to say, I have to say that's the, uh, that was one of the nice things. Once, once I got used to my new schedule, because whenever things happened last year, my schedule got crazy and uh, I was the only person at work for months. And uh, once I got used to that, though, then I was able to arrange things so that I could write more. And uh, so it's funny, you look at my chart and the beginning of the year, beginning of 2020, I was doing great. And then like nothing for three or four months, all, practically nothing. And then I finally picked back up and I finished the year strong, finished another book. And uh, this year, much the same. It's been uh, a, a pretty decent start, although my wife and I also uh, came down with COVID in February. And oddly enough, I, you know, I was the same way when I found out I had it. I was like, oh, my gosh, I've got two weeks at home. I can write. But I had no motivation to do so. Just none whatsoever other than just laying there and watching TV. Well, I wrote um, a complete novel, which we're going to talk about, and then I'm closing in on halfway uh, on a uh, sci-fi that I, I, it's a uh, going to be a trilogy, Ooh. and I'm on I'm almost halfway on the first book. So yeah, I've spent a lot of time writing, and um, it's it's odd to say, but the lockdown has been good to me in terms of doing writings. Yeah, and and that's. That's something that I think, uh, I, I'm a very positive guy. I like to look at the silver lining. And I think, I, I think that's just something if, uh, if more people looked at that silver lining, you look at it like, well, all right, I'm going to make the best of it. Um, you know, I'm a writer. I've got time at home, more time at home. Let's try and make some more writing, try and get some more done. And that's, that's awesome that you, um, I don't know if you felt the same way or saw it the same way, but that, you know, you reacted that, that way as well. So that's cool that you made the most of it. Yeah, and to me, a lot of it was just discipline. I just had to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And um, when I found myself watching TV, I went, no, no, i got to stop this. And so I'm kind of a restless person. I've got to be doing something. I've got to be accomplishing something. And I'm one of these people that I get excited if I throw something away because that means I just made more room, you know, <laughs> or I just, you know, made, whether it's in the refrigerator or if it's on a shelf, you know, and so I've got to be accomplishing something. And the writing really helped. And, and this novel, Paper Doll, that we're going to talk about, um, it was really a challenge to write. And I had to spend a lot of time on it. And the reason was because it's a true story mm -hmm. and I had to keep it true. And so I might type five words and then go, oh, I better make sure that's right in, in terms of something historical write a few more words and, oh, what was that person's name? Because I got to spell it right, you know, and it was just, it was challenging. And so that discipline and the time afforded by the lockdowns really helped. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, that the, the benefits of fiction writing is you can just make it up as you go and then fix it in post. You can go back and like, oh, yeah, let me just kind of spell this out a little bit more and stretch it out or cut it back. You know, if, if you went too long with a sentence or a paragraph, like, yeah, that's too much information. But nonfiction, yeah, you've got to you got to make sure your facts are right. You got to make sure the details are correct, so that, that way you're telling a correct story. Oh my gosh, that's that's a lot of work, man. It was it was daunting because of exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know when you're writing a fiction novel and you've got some time away and you're driving down the road and you think, you know, I'm stuck here. What am I going to do about this? How am I going to either uh, add a twist or add some more conflict or maybe I need to kill off a character and how am I going to do it? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you go down the road and you think, okay, well, I can do this. Okay. Yeah, there's that. Well, you can't do that with a true story. So when you have a hole, you have to figure out what other true aspect are you going to fill in because pacing is a really big deal. And so this story had to have pacing just like a novel because it is a novel but it had to have uh, pacing just like a uh, uh, work of fiction and so you can't go oh i'll do this and that that was really daunting to think okay i've got to get everything true oh gosh yeah that's something 
I, I you know, it's, it's, I think every writer goes through that moment of thinking like, maybe I'll write a nonfiction book and you kind of run through a couple of ideas that, of what you might want to write about, whether it's about writing or maybe it's some other subject or maybe it's a family story like what you've got. But I think probably the majority of us come back with the idea of going, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm having, I'm, I'm going to stick with the uh, fiction. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for all the work that you've put into the, this new book that you stuck it out to tell this story. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll tell you what, unless I write a story about my father, who's uh, would be basically a volume of books, um, I don't plan on doing this again. <laughs> and, and I love the way it turns out. I'm very happy with it. It's just I started researching this story. Well, I know I was doing stuff in 2001, um, and I knew ab- about the story because of you know the, it's a family story. I knew about a lot of things prior to that, of course, and was a, you know had some things in mind way back in the late 1990s. But when I really started working on it was 2001, and so sure I did other things in life. I wrote other novels. I've written three before I got to this, but there was always that aspect of, okay, I'm going to go to this family reunion and see what I can learn and, or, you know, going to do this reading or, you know, then, you know, there's a matter of 300 plus letters that I read between family members and then took notes on all those letters so I could refer back to them easily. And so this is, this is a a product of a minimum of two decades. Hmm. Oh, wow. Man, you know, and I, I, I think uh, it's something we should probably do is, is make sure everybody understands, too, what we're talking about is uh, you heard the name before, people. It's it's Paper Doll is the book that we're talking about. This is uh, Brian's latest book. Uh, Paper Doll is a true story in novel form telling the fascinating stories which added to the American tapestry during extraordinary times. And... Like you said, this is a family drama based on your own family that you've been collecting stories for decades to put this together. What was, uh, I mean, aside from the time and the, you know, the daily toil of having to write this and make sure the details are correct, what was something um, unexpected that you found uh, while writing this? Any, anything like a family mystery or something that just kind of made you go like, whoa, what? Uh, there were several of those, <laughs> but, um, well, have you ever, I don't know how much you're into old movies. I, I grew up watching old movies Love them. and when you watch a 1940s movie, there's a lot of terms they use that we're not familiar with today. Mm. And so like, uh, I don't mean to kick on you, but what they mean is I don't mean to knock you. Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot more time than I realized I would on learning uh, 1930s and 1940s expressions and what they meant. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of expressions to learn. And then when I was writing, I had to make sure that I didn't overdo it, but not underdo it. Because, uh, um, you know, oh, I'll give you an example. I found out that they used the word dude back then. Mm -hmm. I found out through letters. I didn't expect that at all. Now, they didn't use it the way that we do today or a lot of people do today, you know, kind of over the top and right. dude, you know, they didn't do that, <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, I'm kind of a handsome dude, you know, when they're looking in the mirror, some clothes they're wearing, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so that, that was something that I did not anticipate that I would spend so much time researching, um, terminology terms used, uh, colloquial terms from the thirties and forties. Uh, as far as, family mysteries i I don't know mysteries as much as discoveries uh there are four main characters in the story my grandfather his two brothers and his mother well my grandfather and one of his brothers were both six feet tall so we always assumed that one of my uncles was six feet tall and but when i found his um uh, military records he was five nine and three quarter which explains how he fit into a ball turret of a B-24, because we couldn't figure that out. Mm. And we all assumed he was six foot, just like his brothers. And, um, you know, so, oh, and, and something else I learned in all of this is that my, th- this, these are about Army guys. My uh, 
two great uncles were in the army. Well, my one of my uncles went into the Navy and he got out in 16 days. He hated it. Mm-hmm. And how he got out had to do with medical, but we don't know why. And I've ordered the I ordered the uh, records from the U.S. Navy. And a year later, they're saying, OK, we're going to get to you now because, you know, the whole COVID stuff. Sure. Well, um, so he was only in the Navy for 16 days. And the family knew that way back when, but it got forgotten because it wasn't important. But it's important now to, because it had to do with how he ended up in the Navy. And so uh, I, only, I could only make an assumption on, on how he got out, but I do have his discharge papers which show it was for medical reasons. But um, I just got a kick out of that 16 days in the Navy, <laughs> and he wanted out. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that that would be fascinating. I, for me, one of the things I like to do is, uh, like right now, I'm writing a uh, an '80s sci-fi, and I'm kind of including a few. Um, I don't know what you want to say here. Just uh, familiarities. Some of the characters are based on uh, family members. And uh, I'm just writing some things that I knew about them from from long ago, and it's been a lot of fun. Kind of like my my own, actually, my own grandfather, who also <laughs> used to say "dude" all the time. Everything was a dude. You know, we were, we're deer hunting, and yep, that dude come walking down the path, and I blazed away. And uh, but little little things like that, and it's it's very pleasing to put something in there, and they. Were, Average readers not gonna catch that, but like a cousin who reads this one day, maybe you know they're gonna be like, "Oh man, yeah, you, you nailed Grandpa. That was I, I got that." And that is just a little inside thing, I think, uh, between the family. So and I, I find a lot of enjoyment in uh, just let's just putting those little details like that in there. So this, I, I can only imagine this must have been a lot of fun from that aspect for you to get to. Uh, put some some of those, uh, or well, to dive so deeply into these things and learn so much more about your family history. Yes, definitely. And you know what you're talking about is you're capturing that person, you're yeah. capturing how they were, so that the family members who read this book will should hopefully like um, executed as well as I believe I did. Say, yep, yep, that's him. Yep. Um, there, it was, it was, it was fun. It was interesting, but there were times it was, it was tough. Uh, for example, my, um, uh, my grandfather's sister lost the baby at, at uh, birth and she writes a letter to her mother. And I have that letter and I quoted from that letter because I, I do several, you know, I, I quote from letters, you know, for a par- paragraph at a time mm. here and there. And it was a tough letter to read, you know, woman writing her mother saying, I lost our baby. This is what happened. You know, the baby died in the hospital after 10 hours. And so there were things that were really um, emotional. They were, they were tough. And then there were things that were fun, reading letters about when my father was born. And um, that, that was, there, there was a whole, it's covered in the story, but there was a whole miniature little soap opera going on before my father's birth. And um, so, you know, it was it was fun and, and it's fun. So I emailed my dad one day. I said, hey, you were born. And, <laughs> and he knew exactly what I meant because he's um, got the same sense of humor I do. And so, yeah, there were there were times where it was fun and there were times where it really tugged on your heart. And um, you know, my uncle had a girlfriend and, and she was afraid for my uncle, and then knowing what's going to happen, that ima- that adds the emotion to it for me, you know. Yeah. So I had to convey that emotion. Do you think the nostalgia of learning our history? I mean, we have websites like Ancestry.com and other ones, but they don't capture letters. I mean, I don't think a lot of people are sharing personal letters on there. There's maybe some old photographs and information like that, so you can see your family tree. But do you think? we're going to lose some of this in the future because as we progress through the decades, I can't remember the last time I got a letter in the mail. My, my wife and I, I purposely, yeah, my wife and I personally, uh, and purposely 
write letters to each other still, um, just on occasion. Oh, wow. uh, just just to have something sweet, you know, a little throwback to when we were first dating. Uh, but we don't you don't really have that anymore. Everything's email or you know it's digital and. I don't know. I, I kind of I think about it once in a while. I mean, we're we're you and I are part of that generation that last was writing letters. Going forward, we're not going to have a lot of this unless people go around like what you're doing, talking to the family and getting some of these stories, um, sometimes secondhand or, or you know, third person view of well, you had an uncle and they did this and they did that, but I don't have the documents that can prove it anymore. Are, are we losing this? Do you think? I've thought about that a lot, and there's just no doubt in my mind. I'm convinced that's the case. Mm -hmm. History-wise, uh, we're going to know a lot more because of technology. Mm. But in personal history, in families, we're going to have a lot less because email, et cetera, not writing letters. And I'm convinced that uh, photographs are going to be a problem because people pe – how many people do you know – they have hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of photos on their phone. Mm -hmm. And then something happens to their phone and they just lost all that. Yeah. And I don't know the answer, but I wonder how many people are uh, routinely or occasionally doing what my wife does. And that is printing off her um, phone photographs onto, you know, go, go to Walmart or whatever yeah. and print those out. And, you know, she'll select which one she wants to print out, which not. And it doesn't, you know, you don't have to print out all 1,000. But I don't, uh, you know, a lot of people I know and I've talked to, they don't do that. And so you're losing the communication in, in the written form and then in the pictorial form. And I just think um, that is going to make a big dent to, in a negative sense on what people know about their families. Uh, yeah, they're... It was unbelievable how many letters there were. And I don't have all the letters. I just have all that I had access to through one cousin. And and that was 300, and I don't know, I kept forgetting the number. But um, and I would say about 300 of them were between family members, and a few others were from uh, outside people to family members. And, yeah, without that, this this story could not have been written as a true story. Uh, in fact, I want to touch on that just a tad. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a, the first uh, nonfiction novel was Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Okay. So I made sure I read that. But the term that people use today is creative nonfiction. And the reason they use that term is creative means that while the story is true, you have to be creative to some degree. So with the dialogue, for example, I wasn't there. Okay. None of none of my living family was there in some of these instances. And so you do have to create dialogue. And then what I did was I based it upon what they said in letters. So, for example, there's a um, there's a line in the in the novel that my uncle utters that is something to the effect of after the war, anyone who knocks the United States can't be an American. And, and he's. I wasn't trying to pump him up as this patriotic guy. This is what he wrote in a letter. I know he said that, and I used it word for word. Um, and so, so what I tried to do was to avoid the creative aspect as much as possible when it came to dialogue and use what I know of my family and what I knew they had already written because it was really important to keep this as true as possible. But again, you know, I'm not involved in dialogue that was in 1937 or, you know, 1944. Yeah. And that that was something that you, that took a lot of work to make sure that, as you were talking about a moment ago, that you really capture your family member. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think everybody, <laughs> the unintended message here is uh, go print your pictures on your phone. Go collect your letters or write a letter and uh, save it. You know, some people, some family members down right. the road are going to love that. That's <laughs> right. In fact, at the end of the novel, well, first of all, there are appendices and there are photos, not normal for a novel. But I also uh, wrote, I think it was in my bio I wrote, and the one thing I want you to do is to learn your family stories. Hmm. Because, man, there are so many people I talk to, they don't know anything uh, about family members, um, you know, whether it was if they're more distant, 
I knew some. I, I know someone who uh, was a descendant of um, Alex, um, Alexander Hamilton. Okay. And the only thing they knew about him was he was in a duel. And I'm thinking, you have a famous ancestor, and you only know he died in a duel. And then more recent, like your your uh, your parents and your grandparents and your your uncles, etc. I just think it's really important to learn these stories, and then you'll learn how rich your family history is. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. That's, oh, man. Yeah, it makes me want to go and uh, pull out some old photo albums right now, actually. So, <laughs> it's you know, and it's nice, too, to look back. Like, all my kids, except for one, is in their 20s, mid-20s, late 20s, uh, and I've got one that's a senior this year, and then they're going to be out of the house, too, and it's like, I'm sure here pretty soon, probably by the end of this next school year, my wife and I'll be pulling out the photo albums and looking at the kids and I'm like, oh man, where did the time go? But <clears throat> anyway, you know, hey, we should probably move along because I, I want, I noticed here too, during the uh, pandemic, you also wrote another book, Dead Dreams. Tell us about this. Uh, actually, no, Dead Dreams was my second book. My first was Children of the Sun, a okay. sci-fi adventure. Dead Dreams was my first psychological thriller. Oh. Then came Wager of Death. And I met you at Planet Comic Con 2019 when um, Wager of Death had just come out. Right, right. So right, Dead right. Dreams, just real quick, is a um, psychological thriller. It's about a uh, young man who he has just moved back into his family home with his parents. And when he does, he starts having dreams. Each one's different, but they all end the same. He's murdered by his family. So now he starts trying to figure out, are these dreams real? He starts doing research on dreams. He's wanting to, wanting to understand what's going on. But as he learns more and as he lives there longer, the dreams grow more intense. So he decides he either has to stop the dreams or he has to stop his family from killing him. It's called Dead Dreams. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and that seems familiar. I, I, I'm trying to remember now if we get, if we talked about that last time or not. But I, I, I noticed maybe the just a short little yeah, maybe yeah. just short. Okay. Then came Wager of Death. That's what you and I talked about in episode 65 way back when. Yeah. And well, it seems like a long time ago, April 2019. Oh god. And um, <laughs> and so then Paper Doll is uh, coming out now. It, it's the paper book, a paperback has just come out. And this weekend, by the time everyone listens to this, the ebook should be out, and then I will announce it on my um, on my website and my mailing list and the social media sites and all that. So I'll have it just in time for Planet Comic Con, August twentieth through twenty second. Fantastic, fantastic. Now uh, going back to Paper Doll, where does that name come from? It is the name of. My uncle's B-24. He oh. was in the European theater, and he was in the uh, Eighth Air Force at the time. At the time, it was still technically the Army, but they were just starting to use the term Air Force, even though the Air Force wasn't around yet until, mm -hmm. what, 47 or 49. And, uh, but they called it the Eighth Air Force. And um, they, he was in a fleet of um, B-24s, and he was a ball turret gunner. And then when they eliminated that position, he became a waste gunner and uh, W A I S T, and he was an engineer. So the um, the B twenty fours, they they were a great plane and very efficient, but they exploded easily. And so it was the um, I don't recall off the top of my head, but the uh, death ratio was just incredibly high because the the British. They bombed at night, but they you can't be quite as accurate at night, you know, in that technology. The Americans bombed during the day, which is great for hitting your target, but bad because now the Germans can see you <laughs> yeah. and shoot back at you. So um, the the death rate was really high in these B-24s, and a lot of them named their planes. Some of them would lose a plane. The crew would survive. And so they'd get another plane. They'd say, oh, to heck with it. We're going through too many planes. We'll quit naming them. But a lot of them were named. They had um, fancy uh, artwork. They had people who, uh, for whatever reason, they would uh, get a hold of people who could paint well. And um, 
they would have drawings of a lot of the times, high percentage of the time, it was a woman drawn on the plane. In this case, uh, and it, it's in the story, but it was based not on the song that was a big song back in 43, but uh, it was based on a pa- cardboard paper cutout. Card- How am I saying that right? Cardboard cutout of a uh, female op- phone operator. And so because of that cardboard cutout that they stole from a uh, hotel in uh, Salt Lake City, they uh, named their plane Paper Doll. So I know it's an odd name because if you go into, say, Amazon and you search books about paper dolls. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get something very different. <laughs> you don't get any war stories. I guarantee you that. Yeah. Oh, my. But, you know, as, as someone who knows a little bit about it, that name for for a plane of that type, that, that actually makes sense uh, on on a di- certain level of understanding what that plane, what can happen to it. It uh, it makes a lot of sense for a little <laughs> a little playing with the uh, uh, playing with the fire there almost with that kind of a name, but still that's uh, that's fascinating. Well, yeah, and I that was one struggle. Of course, to me. The hardest part is always coming up with a good name for a um, for a, a, a book or a story. You should have seen how long I <laughs> you know, just drove myself crazy before I came up with Dead Dreams. But um, originally, I was thinking about using the term short snorter in the title. But I started <laughs> thinking about that, and I thought, well, how many cocaine addicts are going to buy this? <laughs> no, I probably don't need to do that. Uh, and, you and you may have missed a whole know, audience there, man. <laughs> For those who don't know, a short snorter was um, when someone left the United States, a soldier left the United States and either crossed the ocean or crossed the um, equator, they would start, they would take a dollar bill and they would put their name across the top and then they'd have their buddies sign it. And then what they did when they were overseas, they would, uh, and if they, they ran out of room to put names, they would take a dollar bill to the next one. And so sometimes these guys would have wads of dollar bills wrapped up real tight. And there were different ways that was used. Um, the way I dealt with it in this story, what, what they did in this case was whoever would have the biggest wad of dollar bills in the bar got free drinks. Mm. And, you know, other people would buy them drinks. And so and there, was, there were different uh, ways that they would um, uh, acknowledge these uh, short snorters. But this story started in, and, and, and I say story, I mean becoming uh, a book, way back in 1976, um, my grandparents had just left Kansas City visiting uh, my family. They'd been up north visiting Minnesota relatives, and they were on I-80. They stopped in uh, Salt Lake City. They stopped in a gas station to get gas, and my grandmother received this change. Uh, part of it was a dollar bill, and when she, she just stuck it in her purse, when they got driving down the road, she's, you know, uh, moving her money around to put it where she wants it. She sees handwriting on the back of it, and she sees my uncle's name, which <laughs> this, is, this is 21 years after the war ended. Wow. And, or, no, 31. I apologize. 45 to seven, uh, 76. All of a sudden, my math went astray, astray. So 31 years later, she is given – has changed a dollar bill with with uh, her brother-in-law, my grandfather's brother's name on it, and then a list of other names. That's how this whole chain of events got started. Oh, so my wow. uncle, and when I when I read the, the chapter I read, I'll be referring to Bud, B-U-D. That was his nickname. That's what the family called him. His name was Eugene Peterson. Well, she sees it's his initials and then his last name, uh, E.M. Peterson, and so there's a chance it's not him. Well, my grandfather sent the dollar to my dad. My dad started researching it, and we found out who all the names were. Most of the names were on my uncle's plane. One case was a, um, um agent, like a secret agent, kind of spy kind of guy, hitching a ride. But that's how everything got put in motion, way back in 1976. And this fluke, hard-to-believe event, that my grandmother gets changed with her brother-in-law's name on it. And that's kind of how weird my family is, though. These things happen to my family a lot. <laughs> and that's what helped drive this story. So it's not just, you know, like a soap opera about, 
you know, in the Depression and World War II, there are a lot of interesting things that happen in this, both surrounding the Depression, war. My great-grandmother, she had a lot of premonitions. And these premonitions, it, it was so common with her. Everyone who knew her knew she had these. And so I depict some in the book, and, and part of it plays a central role. And um, so there's a lot there in this story, but it's just odd how everything got started by a short snorter being given as change 31 years after the war ended. That's incredible, man. Holy cow. I mean, it, it, it sounds like something you know, you'd see in a movie. It's like, oh, I, I missed her phone number. She wrote it on this dollar bill and somebody took the change or whatever. Oh, my gosh. It, that's and amazing. And the viewer would be saying, ah, oh, but that can't happen. Oh, that could never happen. Yeah. And yet sometimes in life, things happen that the, the expression, truth is stranger, stranger than fiction. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey, think. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of strange things, uh, we both will be at. Planet Comic Con, the way it stands right now, uh, anyway. Cool. <laughs> Fingers crossed, it's gonna hold out. We'll be at uh, Planet Comic Con, like you said, on August twentieth through the twenty second. Uh, what do you got planned? Anything uh, big going on for that? No, um, I don't cosplay, so there goes that. <laughs> uh, and no, I would just have uh, all four of my novels on sale. Uh, I um, yeah, it's just, to me, it, it's just an opportunity to uh, meet a lot of people. And it's nice because I have people come up to my table and they'll say, hey, I read your first book or I read your second book. Give me another one. And so I'll make sure they understand what the genre is. And I, I, it's fun because I have a, a number of people who will come to my table and they want to read it because I wrote it. And, man, that is just an unbelievable feeling. That's a great feeling. And so I have – you, you develop through these Comic Cons, you develop little followings. Like in Omaha, I do. And then here, um, I'm uh, not bad, but I'm going to try to do better in Wichita. Got a Comic Con I'm going to try to go to. I haven't uh, got it finalized yet in Indianapolis. And so the shows are good because um, you get, you meet people, they like that, they read your book, then they tell other people. And that's the key, whether it's this book or any other is when you like, uh, especially uh, we uh, independent novelists with smaller guys, you know, if, when you tell other people about what you just read, that is so helpful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, telling other people about it, leaving reviews, it's all so incredibly helpful uh, for, for every author, uh, whether you're a big name or especially when you're independent, um, you know, small publishers, and uh, it's huge. It's really huge, everyone. So make sure, you know, whether you're picking up Brian's books or, you know, somebody else, make sure you tell somebody about that book, that, that you enjoyed it, what you liked about it, and, you know, that, hey, you've got to read this book. And uh, and leave a review. Put a review online somewhere, uh, whether it's Barnes & Noble, Amazon, BookBub, Goodreads, or all of them. And... Uh, Go from there. It really helps out a lot and tells that author that you appreciate their work. Uh, Brian, where can, uh, where can people find and follow you? Barnesandnoble.com. Um, my first novel, Children of the Sun, the sci-fi, it is available anywhere new books are sold online. The next two, the psychological thrillers, Dead Dreams and Wager of Death, are only at Amazon. Paper Doll right now is only at Barnes and Noble. Uh, I'll be working on expanding that later, but uh, it was important to me to have this through Barnes and Noble so that I could access bookstores when I go to different cities. And because with Amazon, uh, without getting into that whole deal, it's tougher f uh, for bookstores to be able to afford the book and make a profit by selling it when they buy through Amazon because of uh, Amazon's pricing structure. So I went with Barnes and Noble and right now, barnesandnoble.com. Um, I would go to books, search Brian W. Peterson, and that should pull it up or type my name and paper doll. Yeah. I, you know, I, actually that's exactly what I did. I, I just typed in Barnes and Noble, 
uh, paper doll, and it came right up. So that cool. was cool. <laughs> One thing I want to add that I did in this story is I worked in information, which gave texture to the story. So I wrote what I call interludes. And I didn't put this in the book, but in my mind, they're interludes that I wrote and I inserted. And they're usually at the beginning of some of the chapters. So it lets the reader know the context of events. Uh, Japan's plans for domination of the uh, Pacific, for example, or the state of the economy. Or I, I give, uh, you know, there's a couple pages devoted to the Nazis march across Europe or explaining how ration stamps worked and what people were dealing with, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that way the reader uh, can end, understand the times. Because it's a, it's a different time. It's a lot different time than now. Uh, back then, you could buy a steak dinner for a dollar. Uh, people didn't ordinarily travel far from home at any point in their lives. Uh, my great-grandmother and my grandmother, who were in-laws, not, not uh, related by blood, neither of them ever drove a car. Times were just different. People got their news from newspapers or from movie tone, rule, uh, movie tone reels yeah. in between movies. So, so what I did was there are brief snippets of history woven into the story so that the reader understands the times. The main story is about my grandfather and his uncles during the war, during the depression and during the war. And like I said, there's a lot of interesting things that happen, but the, I really thought the reader needed context. So I didn't go into long history lessons. I just, you know, get some short hits of a couple pages of here's where we are now in world events kind of thing. That's awesome stuff, man. And uh, everybody, I'm going to make sure to have links for uh, in the show notes for all of these websites, everywhere that you can find this and find this incredible book, Paper Doll, on uh, Barnes & Noble. Or or go to, go to Comic-Con coming up here in a few weeks and get one personally signed from Brian. Grab one out of his booth and, uh, and go by there and say hi. Let him know that you heard the, heard this episode. And, uh, yeah, check out all of his books. They're a lot of fun and, uh, he's a, he's a good guy to talk to. So, Brian, thank you so much for coming back on, man. It's been fantastic getting to catch up with you and, uh, hear these incredible stories about, uh, about your books. Thank you. I uh, enjoy chatting with you. It's it's um, two Midwestern boys just having a good chat. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, time for me to step aside with my cup of coffee, which I just got refreshed. And uh, we're going to enjoy this sample chapter from our guest, Brian W. Peterson, with Paper Doll. Okay, I'm going to read chapter 27 of Paper Doll, but I do need to give a couple minor little heads up. First, the people in this story are all true, so even the minor characters. So there are a couple of characters who um, they are in conversations in this story, one Mickey Baskin, another Will Plate. They are people that I met at uh, a reunion. These were people that were actually there at the time. And so instead of making up people, instead of creating fictional characters as friends for my uncle, I knew who he was around. And I, like I said, I met uh, a number of these men. And so what I did was I worked them into the story. So what they technically would not have been in this exact conversation. They knew him and I, I used actual people. So Bud refers to uh, one of the main characters, my, my great uncle. And uh, also I wanted to mention that the, there's a mention several times to Gast or Captain Gast. He is the pilot, the paper doll. So chapter 27. When the 8th Air Force 56 fighter group vacated Hellsworth Airfield in April of 1944, the 489th Bombardment Group wasted little time moving into their new home. The base could house 3,000 men, and with its two large hangars and three runways, the 489th possessed the space to work on and fly their liberators without stepping over one another. The first contingent of B-24s to arrive received a circle W on their tails, just as it sounded, the letter W, with a circle around it. Not long after the first came the second group of squadrons with their plus C tails, including Paper Doll and crew. All the ground crews had arrived earlier, regardless of when their aircraft had flown over. They set up their own tools, 
organized the spaces for each aircraft, patrolled the runways looking for debris and other runway hazards, and molded the base into a home away from home. 90 miles northeast of London and due west across the North Sea from German-held Amsterdam, the airfield sat seven miles from the coast. The River Blythe flowed in an easterly direction, not far south of Halesworth, on its continuous journey to the North Sea, surrendering to the larger body of the little-known town Walberswick. At one point, near the town of Blytheburg, the river became engrossed with a swampy lowland. Farms and truncated forests littered the land, the fecund soil hidden by the multiple shades of lush green crops and trees. At the easternmost point of the British Isles, Halesworth Airfield provided an ideal location for launching airstrikes against the Third Reich. Hey, Pete, Mickey Baskin called out as he hustled across the tarmac to catch Bud. All of us were right. We're going to bomb the Krauts all to hell. He caught up to Bud as he finished his comment. About time, ain't it? Bud said with a firmness, despite his words as a question. Baskin eyed Bud's swinging arm and looked at his wrist. Hey, that's some watch. Bud smiled with a touch of pride. Possessing such a luxurious item was foreign to him. Yeah, I got it in a market in Fortaleza, he said, referring to their stopover in the Brazilian port city. Twenty-one dollars. 21 bucks? You've gone uptown, Peterson, Baskin teased. I can tell you're on a sergeant's salary now. Bud's sheepish grin reflected the austere life he had known. In his younger days, buying a $21 watch would have seemed not just an impossibility, but a waste of money. Now, living on $117 a month and having just sent $100 to his mother, Bud felt good about his finances. He also did what he could to help Conrad. Have you heard trainings about to end? Baskin asked with an excitement flooding his eyes and voice. Yeah, no more dummy bombs or real bombs blowing up fields. He smiled at a sudden thought. I'd like to see Air Gehring's face when we start dropping our eggs on the fatherland. Bud did not write home much in his early days at Halesworth. Colonel Napier kept the men busy. The importance of strict discipline would not be enforced to the same degree once they entered the fray, so this was a good time to get the men into good habits. An excitement filled the air above and throughout the base. Everyone knew what was coming. They were now a full three months past their first fatality when Lieutenant Daniel Blessington of the 845th, the co-pilot on Lieutenant Roy Anderson's crew, perished at Windover in a crash landing as they attempted to bring a crippled bird down while short an engine. Pilots had shared stories about the B-24 morphing into a beast when it lost an engine, and the men never forgot the shock of the loss of life. And the pilots remembered the lessons of the struggles at the controls of a three-engine liberator. The manual stated that the liberator could be flown with only two of its four engines, but the pilots had the attitude of to hell with the manual. On the day before they went operational, two of the bombers collided during a training exercise at a cost of 20 men. The flyers of the 489th were anxious to get training out of the way. Then, on May 30th, 1944, the day finally arrived. While some felt trepidation as the date approached, most did not consider friends and acquaintances would be lost. Bombing Hitler sounded exhilarating, but the reality of war could not be properly anticipated. The difference between the men on the evening of May 29th versus the evening of May 30th could not be missed by any observer. The war, at long last to Bud and his peers, had arrived. Lives would be changed and lives would be lost. Hell had opened its doors. The early morning sun found itself obscured by the low, dense clouds. As the liberators rolled off the tarmac and rubbled down the runways, the 0530 sky should have allowed a greater amount of light to penetrate to the ground. Instead, the murky darkness added additional weight onto the men's nerves. The locals understood the significance of the never-ending roar of engines. This was not a few liberators here and there on practice runs. Townspeople who braved the early morning only saw the aircraft for mere seconds, until the low clouds swallowed up the bombers one by one. To Bud and his friends, the realization of striking at Germany itself brought quiet glee. Though they did not care what the target was, they were just happy with a mission over enemy territory. The assignment was a Folk Wolf factory airfield, which was used for testing new fighter planes. What the enlisted men were not allowed to know was the purpose of the attack. D-Day, the long-awaited Allied invasion of Europe, lay only days away. Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin had begged and shouted 
and pushed in every way he knew for the invasion. He wanted it to happen long before now. But Roosevelt and Churchill were not about to commit until every piece of the puzzle could be removed from the box and ready to be put together in a swift assault. Because of their crew's success at Windover and the flying and leadership abilities of Captain Gast, Paper Doll had been designated as a lead or deputy lead and thus guaranteed to be one of the first planes on every mission it flew. As such, they only flew about one-fourth of the missions compared to most other crews. Gast's job was to participate in strategies and airborne logistical planning. As one of the leads, Paper Doll also carried extra navigator, who served as a backup to Sund and manned one of the waste guns. In their case, they lacked an assigned second navigator, so they were given a different extra on each flight. The planes began their evasive actions, changing course and altitude every 30 seconds. Once the anti-aircraft artillery fired as they passed over land, they flew higher than the Germans expected, and the flak exploded at a lower altitude than needed, allowing safe passage for the bombers. The next time through this area, other tactics would be necessary. Just a reference to flak, an acronym for a German term which roughly translates as aircraft defense cannon, resulted in lumps in the throat for the flyers. While the size of the shells varied, flak was essentially German high-powered grenades, which exploded in attempts to bring down enemy aircraft. The detonation altitude was set by a timer in the shell's fuse, which was adjusted to allow the projectile to explode at a different delay. The flak did not necessarily have to cause damage to be effective. Its presence forced the alteration of altitude and speed by Allied pilots which many times diminished bombing accuracy and can mean the difference between mission success or failure. Navigator to pilot, IP in one minute, Sun called over the interphone. Heading looks good. Target in sight, ready for control, Andy Gustoyan called out from his bombardier's pit, located below and forward of the navigator, who himself was stationed between the nose turret and the cockpit. Pilot to bombardier, you have control, Gast offered. Bombardier to pilot, I have control. Bud could not see the men on the ground, up ahead, scrambling to their planes, but he felt them. He knew they were there, preparing to shoot them from the sky. He rotated his turret in slow increments as he scanned the skies and ground, watching and waiting for the inevitable. As ordered by their superiors and enforced by Gast, only limited, necessary interphone traffic was acceptable. Bombardier opening bomb bay doors, Gosh Join announced. After several seconds of pause, Holbert confused. Roger. Bombay doors are open. Fighters, two o'clock, low and climbing. But excited exclamation did not impress Gast, who recognized his gunner's voice. Pilot to gunner, easy. No need to worry about it. Co-pilot to gunners, fire when they're in range. An explosion underneath the formation rock paper doll. Flak, close enough to be considered accurate. Flak, looks like 88s, but announced, referring to the common and much feared 88 millimeter German shells. Roger, Lane barked. Pilot to crew, stay calm. The sphincter nerves of each man tightened, even as gas gave the order to maintain lower blood pressure. At the same moment, another burst of flak exploded 200 yards below and behind them. Bud saw one of the three other planes in their separate formation rock. Within seconds, the dozens of other four-ship formations watched as the flak grew closer yet. Bombardier to pilot, bombs away. Roger, bombardier. Radio to bombardier, all bombs away. 109's coming in two different points, port side low. It was Utah native Stodmeister, itching for action. 10 o'clock low, he corrected himself. Savage, let's get the hell out of here, Gas said in an even tone, despite the urgency of his words. Fighters at 10 o'clock in closing, McIntosh tried not to shout, lest he draw the ire of their captain. The flak had stopped, clearing the way for the German fighters. Don't worry, Gunner, Gas said, his voice smooth as velvet. The escorts will take care of them. Ball to bombardier, nice eggs, Bud called out. More incoming, McIntosh shouted from his turret position. He had no patience for the American fighters to engage. A direct hit from McIntosh eased this tension. Smoke puffed from the Messerschmitt DF-109 as it fought to descend at a survivable rate. McIntosh followed his training and avoided the urge to watch or continue firing at an enemy out of action. Instead, he scanned for additional threats. Unfortunately for him, most of the fighters attacked bombers behind him and out of range. Bombardier to crew, we put several holes in the tarmac. Took some planes with it, too. Congratulations, 
someone shouted without identifying himself. But it began firing when his first enemies came into range. He watched as one of the B-24s rocked hard from a hit from a fighter, dropped 100 feet, then fought to regain its proper placement in the formation. Damn it, Bud stopped shooting at a German plane when it flew too close to a bomber formation. He did not wish to down one of his own. As Bud and company watched, a rising 109 raced through the formation. They wanted to fire, but could not risk hitting friendly. He could not be sure where the German 13mm machine gun rounds ended up, but he had no indication Paper Doll absorbed any hits. Bud lost sight of the rising German plane for a few seconds before it pitched forward, downward, and through the formation again, firing its machine guns. Bud could not get a shot until it passed below the formation to allow for a clean line of fire. That pilot's crazy, Bud called out in an even voice. He's not going to survive the war, Lane agreed. As the formation flew toward the Netherlands, the German fighters peeled off. Additional flak began over the Netherlands, but quickly died out. Pilots of radio, what did you learn about our escorts? Why the no-shows? Radio here, there was confusion among the fighter groups. Less than half made it to us. Navigator to pilot, oxygen check. Pilot to navigator, oxygen good. Navigator to co-pilot, oxygen check. Co-pilot to navigator, I'm still here. Roger that. Navigator to bombardier, oxygen check. This went on throughout the entire crew in a specific order every 15 minutes until they passed below 10,000 feet. Until Bud's name was called, he drifted away mentally, thinking about his situation. 4,000 miles from home, dropping bombs and firing guns, visiting foreign lands but rarely a tourist. Life had taken a turn he had not foreseen while living a great life in Popovsky as an innocent kid or hauling grain in North Dakota or even yelling at the Army recruiter in Bemidji. The killing did not bother him, which, to his knowledge, the crew of the paper doll had yet to do, but the odd thought of having visited multiple countries, flying over two or more today, and seeing the world under unfathomable circumstances caused him to pause and observe his surroundings. He knew the formation had entered the airspace of Holland, the northern part of the country of the Netherlands where the term actually applied, but he did not know anything about her people or her history. He could not see their art or architecture, or scenery from the air, even though the first two topics did not ordinarily concern him at any other time. His first experience in battle saw bombs drop, fighters attack, anti-aircraft artillery explode, and tensions rise. But he survived. He looked down at the Netherlands and the approaching North Sea, a body of water he could not even recall knowing about until recently, and ended his ruminations with an overwhelming urge. Ball the pilot, I'm getting out of this contraption. Radio to Pete, I hear we get a shot of whiskey after every mission, Holbert teased Bud. You're going to need a double shot. Whiskey? No kidding, Bud asked as he climbed out of the ball turret and grabbed the walk-around oxygen bottle. No kidding, Peterson, Holbert laughed. Will, Bud called out to a friend a few feet in the mess hall. Hey, Pete, Will Plate answered. The pilot in the 847th, he had a wife back in Crane, Texas. Did you fly today? Yes, sir, Plate said. We dropped our eggs and had a direct hit on some Nazi birds on the tarmac. Smiling, Bud added to the story. Same here. We were near the front, deputy lead plane, and it was a hell of a view from the ball turret, I'll tell you that. Plate shook his head at the ball of death at the back of the planes. I heard we lost somebody, Bud said with a slow, pained voice. Yeah, I didn't hear which squadron, Plate said as he stepped up to request food from the servers. I'll take one of those. I just know it was a Circle W, and I don't know who. Bud looked at a man holding a large ladle ready to dip it into a vat of dark soup when requested. What's that, pal? Bud inquired. Look, mister, the corporal snarled. If everybody asked what everything is, it'd take all day for the line to go through. We ain't got all day. You want it or not? The northeastern accent made the experience worse for Bud. Might as well, Bud sneered. If the Germans don't kill me, a smart-ass corporal from New York will. New Jersey, the man snapped. New Jersey, Bud repeated. Hey, we don't need to drop bombs. We can just drop knuckleheads from New Jersey. The Krauts will kill themselves. The corporal sloshed the soup into a bowl and thrust it over the counter at Bud. I know somebody else got killed on a plane, but I don't think it was anyone we knew, Plate added as he slid down the line and motioned for a piece of pie. What got him? Flack? Yeah, that's some nasty stuff, that flack. It looked like flies on rotted meat, Plate added. When I'd spin around and look backward, it was a sea of black puffs everywhere, until the fighters came, of course. 
Well, half the fighters. How nervous were you in the ball turret? Eh, not bad. It was a view like no other, I can tell you that. I could see the whole show. Emotionally, the day's events did not take a toll on Sergeant Peterson. But when he returned to barracks, he did not feel the urge to write family members. Instead, he lay on his bed, on top of the blanket, leaned his head against the wall, and listened to his friends tell their tales. At this point, successful missions and returning to base safely were all that mattered. After listening to others for a while, he finally relaxed enough to undress, crawl under the covers, and sleep. As anticipated, he dreamed about the day's mission. All right, y'all, that was Brian W. Peterson reading a fantastic sample chapter from his latest book, Paper Doll. It's based on family stories. It's so, so much of this is real, and it's an incredible story. I clicked that link in the show notes for Brian and uh, the books over at uh, Barnes & Noble. It's available right now. You can also find links for our podcast friends and information about the upcoming Planet Comic Con in Kansas City, August 20th through the 22nd. And make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss that next week when I'm back with a new author, a new book, and an all-new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. Talk to you again real soon. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. Network.